Chapter 7, A Message for Uncle Sobat In spite of his disapproval of Uncle Sobat's new way of life, Sasky felt empty when he had gone. Loneliness filled the little hut. The mats lay on the floor where the three of them had slept. He stood in the middle of the room, feeling as though something important had gone from the house. We must work hard today, his father said. It will take us three or four days to reap that last field. I'm not sure Sobat will come back. They worked hard that day and the next, but in spite of his new charm, Sasky couldn't help thinking about the rest day down in singing water. He pictured in his mind how Rajan's face would look when Uncle Sobat told him how Jerob's faith and trust in the new magic was growing and how Kooning's hatred increased every day. He could see the people gathered in the teacher's house and he knew the hymns that they would be singing. He knew that after the morning hymn and the teaching that they would sit around Rajan's big front room telling all that had happened to them during the week. In the deep places of his heart, he longed to be with them, yet his mind rejected the thought with anger. He held the little carved bone charm in his hand. How long would it take this little piece of bird bone to drive the thoughts of God from his mind? He wondered whether Uncle Sobat would come back. No one had asked him to. In fact, his leaving the house had been rather unpleasant. But Uncle Sobat did come back early on the morning after the rest day. He was full of excitement about something the teacher had told him in their worship period the day before. You know, he said with a glowing face, the teacher read to us from God's book, and it says that if we have trust like a grain of mustard seed, we can ask what we will of God, and he will do it. He drew out a folded paper and opened it with great care. Inside the paper, there were tiny orange-colored seeds. Mustard seeds, Uncle Sobat explained. He held them out for Paco and Saski to see. The teacher Rajan gave them to me. He got them from the Chinese gardener at Inaman, down at the foot of this mountain. He showed them to us all yesterday. He gave every family a few to plant so we could understand better about the mustard seed and trust in God. Mustard seed? Mustard seed? Sasky had seen the Chinese mustard and eaten the leaves for greens. The plant was commonly used as a vegetable by the Chinese, but he had never seen the seeds before. The kingdom of God and his word are like these seeds, Uncle Sobat was saying. A little seed gets into a person's heart. It begins to grow, and soon there is a big trust in God. Then his face shone with joy. You see, we need only a little trust to receive what we ask for. His thoughts seemed to wander in far places. But that tiny bit of trust must have life in it. Life like these little seeds. Then Uncle Sobat divided the seeds in his hand into two portions. He gave half of them to Sasky. Plant them today in the garden. See what they will do. He wrapped the other seeds in the paper again and tucked them into a pouch at his belt. The boy took the small seeds into his hand and looked at them. All the way to the rice field he held them and he planted them under Uncle Sobat's direction at the edge of the clearing near the rice field where they had prepared a vegetable garden. The last of the rice was gathered that day. They all worked hard, and it was late when they had washed and eaten. When Uncle Sobat went to talk to Jerob, Sasky said he would go to bed because he was so tired. The boy knew that Uncle Sobat would tell Jerob all about the mustard seed. He had been thinking about it all day. He tried to get it out of his mind, but it was stuck there. Had God known of his desire to be in singing water yesterday and sent him these little seeds? It seemed quite probable. In spite of himself, he kept wondering 
What would be his most urgent request if he came to trust in God, as did Uncle Sobat and Jerob? He could have anything he wanted from God if his trust was as big as a grain of mustard seed. He thought of several things he would like to have. He lay on his mat, wrapped in deep thought. When his uncle returned, he had not yet slept. He saw him come into the room and lie down on his mat. The moon was bright. It would soon be full. Then Saski knew for certain what was the most urgent request of his heart. The medicine of madness. Let it come to nothing and be harmless. Of course, Saski knew that he had no right to make any request of God. He was against God. He was all for the old customs. The charm, the charm. He felt for it. And with it folded tightly in his hands, he fell asleep. It was still dark outside when Saski was awakened by his uncle Sobat, calling in a loud voice of wonder and delight. I will have my wish. I will have my wish. My little Vivi will hear and speak. She will be like other children. Saski and his father set up, rubbing their eyes and peering into the darkness to see what had happened. You work too hard in the rice field, brother, Paco said gently. You are dreaming. Go back to sleep and rest. It is not near morning yet. No, no, Uncle Sobat was lighting the coconut oil lamp. No, no, I must not sleep more this night. I must tell you, it was a man. He looks like a God teacher. But he is big and tall, much bigger than Rajan. He was dressed all in white, and he told me that my prayer is heard. God will make it as I have asked. Uncle Sobat was so excited, he couldn't sit down. He danced about the little oil lamp on the floor like a joyous child. Man, that is impossible. Paco stood up. His face became very stern. We have seen many people in our tribe who were born without hearing and without words. None of them ever came to be any different. Don't be a fool. This is madness. Paku took hold of his brother and shook him as though he would jerk the foolish notions out of his head. Then he spoke more quietly. Be content to have Vivi as she is. She is healthy and strong. She is a good child. She will learn to work and help you when she is older. Uncle Sobat paid no attention to anything they said. He continued to repeat again and again, My little Vivi, she will be like other children. The light on his face was like nothing they had ever seen before. Their words fell around him like dead leaves on the forest floor. When the first faint streaks of dawn filtered through the coconut tree outside the window, he prepared to leave. I must tell Vivi's mother. I must tell Rajan. He flew out the door and down the mountain path like a winged creature. Saski stood with his father in the door of their hut and watched him go. He disappeared among the jungle trees below the village. The sun had not yet reached the rim of the mountain, but the freshness of early morning lay over everything. The boy looked at his father. He really believes it, Paku said more to himself than to Saski. And I'll not be surprised if it doesn't happen, the boy cried. His father looked at him in alarm. It has never happened among our people. It never... Saski interrupted him. The God teaching never came among us before. It was still so early in the morning that Jerob would probably not be awake yet. Still, Saski hurried over to the chief's house and called in front of the door. You are early this morning, Jerob said, rubbing his eyes and yawning. Where is your uncle? Has he gone back to singing water already? He has gone, Saski said in an excited voice. 
He ran down the hill like a mountain deer. He saw some kind of big God teacher in the night, and the God teacher told him that his little girl will speak and hear again. Jerob turned on his mat and gasped in surprise. Did he really hear and see such a thing? What do you think it means? Oh, I'm sure he really saw the man and heard what he said. You know, he grieves so much because Vivi can't hear or talk. He asks God every day to make her like other children. Do you think it will come true? The chief's son sat propped up on his pillows with parted lips and wonder in his eyes. Saski thought he saw some of the brightness of the God of heaven about him, too. I know the God of heaven is strong. He could make Vivi hear and talk, I'm sure. Such a thing would not be too hard for him, Saski admitted unwillingly. You don't think Kooning has made some devil medicine against him and he has gone crazy, Jerob asked. Oh, no, no, the boy's heart leaped with terror. No, surely it couldn't be that. Kooning says the devil medicine makes people confused and sad and sick, grieved and hopeless. They both sat and thought about it, and Saski's secret trembled on his lips, but he choked it back. Not now, not now. It was too dangerous. He knew that Uncle Sobat had never been healthier or happier in all of his life. It couldn't be the devil medicine. Somehow, every person in Broken Light Village heard of the wonderful thing that had happened to Sobat in their midst. They heard it that very day. It was talked of in the gardens, in the jungle, and around the oil lamps in the houses. Many opinions were given on the matter. Some said the poor man had worked too hard in the hot sun and without doubt was coming down with a heavy fever. Others said that the new witchcraft was driving him mad. A few were awed with the thought of the great promise Sobat had received, and amazed that a messenger from the God of Heaven had appeared in the village of Broken Light. What would happen next? Excitement ran through the village. Some of the people found excuses to go down to Singing Water on errands. They came back and reported that everyone in Singing Water knew about the big God teacher who had appeared to Sobat, but the child was unchanged. Kooning was in favor of getting up a big devil feast. Let us drive this new witchcraft out of this village so the spirits will feel comfortable again, he urged. Otherwise, we may expect some great calamity. But at our last devil feast, Jerob was hurt, and because of that, the teacher from Singing Water came here, Paco reminded him. After much discussion, it was decided that the matter of a feast would wait until they could see how things would turn out. The chief was inclined to waver between the new teaching and the old customs. The situation was clearly out of hand, and Cooney gnashed his yellow teeth in rage.